Hello and welcome to the Tai Chi Notebook Podcast. This is a place for anybody who loves Tai Chi or martial arts in general. My name is Graham Barlow and I've been practicing Tai Chi and Shingi for over 25 years now. I'm also a first degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and run the Tai Chi Notebook blog, which you can find over at thetaichinotebook.com. I created this podcast for anybody who wants to find out more about Tai Chi, martial arts, or just meet other great martial artists. My first guest is my good friend Daniel Moraz, a professor in theatre studies at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He has a long and varied background in different Chinese martial arts, including Choi Li Fat and Chen style Tai Chi. Over the next hour, we're going to have a really good, wide ranging discussion about what Chinese art might really be. It's a great conversation, and we hope you enjoy it. So, let's get deeper under the skin of Chinese martial arts. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Tai Chi Notebook podcast with real humans in. Um, today I'm joined by a good friend of mine who I'm very pleased to have here. This is Daniel Moraz. Daniel, how are you? Very well. Thank you for allowing me to be the first human. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've taken back control from the robots. Um, <laughs> that's all good. Um, you've got an extensive background, not only in theatre, um, but in China's martial arts too. So, uh, I mean, Choi Li Fat is one of your the main things that um, that springs to mind when I think of you. But you also did some Chen Tai Chi, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I used to live in Montreal, where I studied Choi Li Fat for I think thirteen years. And then when I moved here to Ottawa, I was introduced to uh, Chen Zhonghua, who is uh, a well-known. Taiji teacher. He wasn't actually that well known at the time. He's become very, uh, very celebrated and famous. And so when I moved here, I started studying with him. And so most of this, what I've done since leaving Montreal has been uh, in Chen Taiji. Cool. Um, and the reason we know each other is that um, I, my good friend Paul Bowman, who who I, I like to refer to as my Tai Chi student because it makes me feel superior to him. <laughs> um, he He's one of the, the sort of leading lights in the um, martial arts studies academic um, growing field of academic interest. Um, and you were a speaker in Cardiff for the, um, the conference that he ran, one of the conferences he ran. Uh, this was 2016, I think. Yes. And... I didn't know who you were, and I wandered into the lecture hall, um, wondering who all these strange academics were who were talking about martial arts. I think it was when Ben Judkins was doing his keynote at the start, and I just sat down next to you because I thought you looked friendly. <laughs> but, but we instantly started talking, and, and I remember you went, you're Graham. You're the Graham. And I was like... I am," he said. And he said, "I've been reading your stuff on the internet for years." <laughs> and it was the uh, what I wouldn't say it was the only time I've been recognised by Tai Chi people. Um, one guy, one guy, just came up to me randomly at a garden centre once and said, "Are you Graham?" <laughs> but that's another story. But it was it was a uh, it was great to uh, to bump into you like that and. Uh, yeah, how did you find that conference? Um, that first one, especially, I've been to. I think I've been to two, and that one, I had a marvelous time. I met all sorts of excellent, interesting, unusual people. There was that wonderful presenter who was the uh, the bodyguard of the Maori king. You know, like yes. things that things that yeah. one doesn't get to run into in day to day life. Um, and you know, I, I met Paul. I, I met Doug Farrer. Yeah, it was. Uh, I met you. It was really, really a good time. And uh, yeah, conferences tend to be somewhat of a chore and very schematic. And they're big academic conferences. The big ones are usually they're kind of job fairs. You know, you got a lot of stressed out young people running around trying to get work, and. Uh, impress people with their presentations and this one was so entirely the opposite of that and Paul Bowman had mm. been so good about setting up 
social time. So there was, you know, it was like free food and free booze numerous times. Yes. That lasted yes, good. <laughs> really a long time. You know, people could really wander around, spend a good long time talking to, to each other. It, yeah, it was a, a really a, a high point and a model for how to actually get people to interact. It was super good. Yeah, and there were little there were little chances to, to sort of get hands on because everyone was although they're this is what I don't think people understand about martial arts academics. They're all martial artists as well. well not all, but a lot of them are. So there's a lot of chance to get hands on with people and like, oh you do this martial art, I do that one. Let's you know, let's share some techniques. And in fact we, we, we ended up doing a bit of trolley foot exchanging right before your your speech didn't we yeah i think it was more that we were doing some uh pattern push hands and you decided to show me what it's like if someone shoots in on you while you're doing oh, yeah. that <laughs> so i'm sort of standing with my back to a podium and graham tackles me and i just think well <laughs> we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that wasn't really fair to do was it just before you had to go on and talk to the <laughs> to your colleagues I think it was great actually it really cleared my head you know I was suddenly I was not worried about anything <laughs> after after being single legged numerous times by Graham it was yeah the conference itself was a breeze <laughs> yes I think a, a double leg would have been far more catastrophic but a single leg just wakes you up right yeah yeah I mean, actually, I was I was teaching single legs this morning in jujitsu, but that's another story. Mm. Um, anyway, we got on we got on really well. I think the the free booze, although I don't remember it being that free. I remember going to a bar, and, and several bars. In fact, we might have gone to in the end, but it, a great time was had by both of us, and then we we instantly formed a nice bond over Chinese martial arts, which is the subject we we need to get onto today. All right. Um, so you've just written an article, and my notes here tell me, uh, which I've now lost. <laughs> it's for a journal, isn't it? This is for, um, there's a British journal called Theatre Dance and Performance Training, and they're doing a special issue about martial arts training for the performing arts. And so I'm preparing this, which is about spatial projection, our ability to take I guess our tactile senses that we would develop either in something like push hands or grappling and gradually expand them out. So we have a kind of a synesthesia, I suppose, experience of the space around us and we become more sensitive to it. Yeah. And it's, it's through the practice of Chinese martial arts uh, in the theater that, that you're developing this sense of space and in the article, you've you've written a, a marvelous paragraph, which um, which defines what we mean by Chinese martial arts, which is a really good thing because nobody ever has quite the same understanding of what it means. So it, it's always good to define your terms, um, and I, I really liked your definition. It's quite long, but it contains lots of really good things. I'd like to unpack over the course of this this episode. So um, do you want to hit us with your definition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm going to read this and I'm going to hopefully read it very clearly. And also I'm going to sound very confident while doing it. And obviously this is my definition that I'm working with right now for this particular article. And other people could come up with other ones. But what I was trying to do was to cover all the key elements that I feel characterize Chinese martial arts, both practically like what we do and historically where it comes from so that's the purpose of this next reading by chinese martial arts i refer to folkways that began to assume their present form from the mid-19th to the early 20th centuries at the end of the imperial and the beginning of the republican periods of Chinese history. These arts train credible fighting abilities through exacting physical conditioning, through partnered combative drills and games, and through the practice of prearranged movement patterns called Tao Lu. For millennia, 
Up to the end of the imperial period in 1912, China explicitly understood itself as a religious state. Communities across China not only used their martial arts to defend themselves, they performed them as theatrical acts of religious self-consecration, communal blessing, and entertainment in an annual calendar of sacred festivals. Modernization and secularization at the end of the imperial period removed the original context of these practices. The Chinese martial arts were transformed over the course of the 20th century by both their worldwide spread and by their ideological appropriation by the Chinese Republic after 1912 and the communist state that succeeded it in 1949. Their religious heritage forgotten in many social and cultural contexts within greater China and internationally, the arts we practice today combine a legacy of pragmatic combat skill, religious inaction, participatory recreation, competitive athleticism, and performed entertainment. There you go. Great. That's nice. So there's, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in the idea of, of what we're actually doing when we practice Chinese martial arts. Um, because a lot of it, I won't say it doesn't make sense, but there is a lot of content in what we do that you, you have a, 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 a sort of a, an explanation given from your teacher about why you need to do this long form that lasts 20 minutes. But... There's no harm in asking the question, why are we really doing this? What, what, what's going on? So um, I think your definition helps to unpack a bit of the content of the Chinese martial arts and what, what we have today and what, where it's come from. So do you want to, where do you want to start? <laughs> um, I thought I'd, you know, I use a lot of terms quite freely in there and I thought maybe we could go through kind of sequentially, like in the order they are mentioned, and say a little bit about them and unpack them. And if I'm, you know, going down some kind of uh, rabbit hole of pedantry, I hope you will wave frantically <laughs> and pull me out of it. Um, yeah. The, no, I'll, I'll just push you in further. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, this wonderful term, folkways, which I think most people know, like it's the, the Smithsonian record label archive is called folkways so there's like all this fantastic music from all around the world on the folkways label um but the term means this mode of thinking feeling or acting that is common to a given group of people so it's a nice term because lots of things can go into it it's a little bit nebulous on the edges and it doesn't rule things out it's very inclusive and it really emphasizes that we're looking at cultural practices. And so, you know, you look at a culture that's different from your own, you want to remain open to the possibility that your own usual definitions of things might not match up. And when we look at the Chinese martial arts, really like, structurally like what do people do right now um i think these three things cover it we might be able to break it down some other way but we have fundamental physical yes. conditioning we have all kinds of partner drills and games and we have taolu these extended sequences of movement and they can be excuse me they can be solo they can be partnered you've even got these battle arrays that are preserved in Taiwan that are like, you know, 107 people doing uh, forms together or, uh, you know, a group choreography. So there's a there's really a giant spectrum. Um, but really, we can say, yes, we're doing, you know, repeating single movements or small segments of movement to condition ourselves and to learn those movement patterns. And, you know, that can be really quite intensive and then we're playing all kinds of simple or complex games where the rules can be really tight or really loose with partners and then we have these choreographies so i think that kind of if we're going to do a systemic look that does cover an awful lot of it and we could say in the conditioning part yeah there's like recovery and stretching and 
stuff like that, breathing exercises that could all fit into that. Qigong. Part. Yeah. And then the the thing that I, I suppose is takes up most of that paragraph I just read is that I'm talking about Chinese religion, which is a subject that has been fantastically misrepresented for most of Western academic history. In the last 40, 50 years, we've had extraordinary scholarship in religious studies and anthropology. Uh, and I, I'm painting with a very broad brush, but it's like the rest of the world hasn't caught up. And so most of our ideas about Chinese religion are really strange and out of date. Um, so the religious culture of China, we could describe generally speaking as coming out of uh, animism, the belief or the idea that every part of nature is possessed of some sort of spiritual essence, and also polytheism. So there are multiple spiritual forces, there are multiple deities. And then this is the thing that you had steered me to yesterday with uh, suggesting I um, to... This is a great word, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. So I was... Graham suggested I listen to uh, my fellow Canadian, uh, Stephen Kesting, uh, speaking with one of his colleagues, and uh, who's a, I think an evolutionary anthropologist, Chris Kavanaugh. And Chris Kavanaugh yes, is studying right. things in Japan, and he uh, is studying religion in Japan. And he uh, brought up this pair of terms that I think are a little, could be a little pedantic, but it's worth exposing, uh, we can look at religious behavior uh, through two lenses. One is orthodoxic, from orthodox and doxa, which is what people believe. And then we can look at it in terms of orthopraxic values, what people do. And the uh, explanation of this that Chris Kavanaugh gives is, you know, if I'm living in Japan, I could get named as a baby in a Shinto ceremony, I could get married in a Christian ceremony, and I could be buried at a Buddhist funeral. And nobody gets worried about that. Because yeah. the preoccupation is, were those particular rituals done correctly? And this is the orthopraxic view of religion. And in contrast, you know, if I'm here in Canada and I go to church on Sundays and then I go to a mosque five times every other day um, if either of those two communities discover my behavior they'll invite me to choose one of them uh, my practices would be considered incoherent because the belief is more important and those two belief systems are considered to be incompatible so like the example that uh, Chris Kavanaugh gives, Chinese religion is orthopraxic. It's based on what people do rather than what people believe. And in the sort of the history of explaining world religions, we often get this Chinese religion is composed of three teachings, you know, the San Zhao, which is Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. And that is true, but it is kind of only true if you're looking at Chinese religion from an orthodoxic perspective, that there are these three things. Uh, and I think it's also an internal, like San Zhao obviously comes from, a, it's a Chinese idea, but those are the three like super clean and uh, what's the right word, um, socially acceptable schools of thought you could get involved in. and regional local practices are you know not as uh, as valorized they're not as high status so these are the three high status ones but of course one is in that culture sampling from these three in terms of what rituals one does so i hope i haven't made a convoluted mess of this but really so we're saying that Chinese religion is orthopraxic rather than orthodoxic. Yeah. yeah. And then it's also modernity has happened and that's 
changed all kinds of contexts. So like it's also a little bit that things are artifacts now that are done perhaps with less knowledge of the background and are done incompletely. So what we now look at it, when we're engaging with contemporary manifestations of that is, you know, really complex. One, because it's different from what we're used to. Two, it's not helpful to conceive of it in the way we're used to conceiving of religion. And three, it's been changed by the last 150, 200 years of world history. I've already mentioned Chris Kavanaugh, who seems really interesting. And then this is uh, another person I'm going to mention is uh, Peter Johnson, who is this uh, the expert swordsmith. Uh, he's Scandinavian, and uh, he, I think he makes swords for Albion, which is the, I think that's a British company, given its name. <laughs> Maybe it isn't. Um, but he has a wonderful presentation about the, sort of the, the cosmology of medieval Christianity and how the numbers and principles like you know the trinity is three and the sort of cornerstones of the church is four and he goes through and counts up to ten um, and then explains how the geometric shapes three-sided figures four-sided figures and so on inform the construction of the medieval sword and so i risk kind of confusing everyone by saying Chinese religion, really different from Christianity, but then giving an example from Christianity. But this uh, instantiation of the culture and worldview right into objects is something that is really helpful uh, when we're considering the relationship between Chinese martial arts and Chinese religion. And I would even hesitate to say those are two different things. Again, those are categories that we carry as being really self-evident, but if you look at other cultures, those categories might shift around a little bit. So if you know you can stop listening yeah. to me and Graham, go listen to Peter Johnson talk about swords, which you know he's amazing. I, I absolutely recommend every single recording of his. And uh, then come back. And <laughs> so, Greg, you know, just like stop me with stuff. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to develop off of this idea of orthopraxic religion, there are a whole bunch of practices. And there's a Dutch scholar of Chinese religion called John Lagerway, and he's got a great book called China, A Religious State. The title says it all. Um, and he divides that orthopraxic position into two big categories and so you have uh these are amazing names uh di yuan and shui yuan so the fate of the earth and the fate of blood and he said these are two kind of spiritual chinas that are coexisting with you know geographic china and the uh the, the di yuan the earth preoccupation is space so we associate places with spiritual entities and we're farmers and we want things to work out. So we're going to have relationships with those sp spiritual entities that represent space. And then the other one, uh, the blood, uh, is time. So generations of people. And uh, Doug Farah talks about this when you go into a a relatively well-established Chinese martial arts school. There are all these photos of previous teachers yeah. on the wall, and he said, "You know, this is a—it's a deathscape." Um, Doug likes dramatic language, so uh, this is the, the death you know, scape. going into the deathscape. But yes, like the the understanding is that you know my practice of this martial art is preceded by a whole lot of dead people. I'm the little wiggling, <laughs> and you know I'm the shoot on. The branch of the tree and the branch of the tree looks dead but the living people are the leaves and so these are two ways of accounting for uh lived experience which is space and time and uh Lagerway is very persuasive about uh describing the various rituals of chinese orthopraxy in terms of propitiation 
to entities that control space and propitiation to the entities that preceded us, in other words, our ancestors. So we have these two categories, space and time, and we do rituals related to space and time. And as people who play Chinese martial arts, it's very obvious to us which elements of the practice are to do with the ancestors of the style and the lineage. And it's less obvious that most of the training has to do with this first category of space. That playing Tao Lu, that doing excruciating conditioning is from an orthopraxic point of view, a religious expression of the divin, the boundary or the, the spiritual world of the earth spirits. Just going to say that um, even my jiu-jitsu school, which is Brazilian, um, has pictures of dead people on the wall. <laughs> so It's pretty universal. And, you know, it's really persuasive, right? You go in, you're like, wow, all this came before me. Cool. It's real. You know, it's, it's got substance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There you go. It's all about the blood. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, a little bit more jargon, I guess, in terms of the uh, religious expression and Chinese martial arts, we can look at the practice of Chinese martial art as a kind of self-consecration. So by doing this thing that you received from the lineage in a particular space you're making yourself kind of spiritually viable or spiritually condensed i'm not thinking in good english this morning um, and consequently your actions are meritorious and bring merit to your community by performing and so you could be performing for yourself, like this is my training. You're performing by being part of class. You could be performing as in, oh, now I'm demonstrating, you know, Tao Lu or all those adjacent things like uh, lion dancing and uh, playing the music and so forth. All those activities are, they change you because you become this kind of spiritual vessel and they change the environment. Uh, and this is a, a word that the spell checker doesn't like. Uh, they create they're, they're exorcistic they remove the presence of martial artists who are upstanding and full of merit banishes bad vibes like i'm using very mixing academic and colloquial language here but really you know you come in with a big drum and a big gong and you perform Lu and you've changed the atmosphere you know, the, whatever the martial arts group is, could be a little self-interested. They're like, we are in this area and we are marvelous and look at us. Like there, there's certainly uh, opportunities for vainglory, but those are kind of buried underneath or superseded by, yes, this is a meritorious act for the community. It, in a way, you, you can almost feel that though, when you perform a form and it, and it goes well, you, you, you finish and you kind of like, and you kind of feel good, don't you? Yeah, um, my own experience and like watching and doing like there's a there's a marvelous silence at the end, and it's the that kind of silence where you know not it has X meaning, but in the poetic sense, like it, it is full of meaning, and you have the impression that everyone is suddenly sharing in a similar way of feeling. Yeah. But I mean, even if you're just on your own, when, when, I, when I practice my forms in the morning, you know, I don't know what it, what it is or, or how to express that feeling, but there's definitely a feeling of I've done some good work and it's finished. And, you know, it's one of those sort of intangible qualities. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is where we, again, get into the idea of cultures look at things and explain them quite differently, that that intangible quality is perhaps something that 
we would feel. This is sort of hard to describe, but everybody feels it, but uh, we can't find a simple location for it, so we're going to think it's not so real. And in another culture, that might be, oh, no, that's really there. Of course that's there. Everybody feels it. What are you talking about? Um, so, again, like sensitivities to feelings or the categories we put feelings in another uh, difference between cultures and something where we should really keep an open mind. We've, 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 we've gone down a rabbit hole. Let's get back. Sure. Um, I uh, made some notes here and I, I suppose the, the next thing I was hoping to look at was, this is a little out of order from my paragraph, but like, martial arts and theater and this is leaping to the present day in a way like what's the potential relationship there and so for people who have perhaps a limited experience of theater um, and training for theater like what is theater training and there's a senior colleague of mine named Ian Watson and he came up with these two great categories and so when you go to theater school or you do an apprenticeship or you strike out by yourself, you're going to wind up doing these two things. Um, psychophysical training and physio-vocal training. And so psychophysical training is all about getting credible timing. When we see people who are amateurs or self-conscious, they respond to others on stage with strange timing and it's jarring for us and it can be funny or it's just not convincing. And so psychophysical training is to figure out how do I externalize my decision-making process and if I'm having a conversation with you, Graham, uh, and we're on stage, I'll take all my timing off you rather than off my own preoccupations. And so I externalize my decision-making process and I'm suddenly going to be to a third party more credible because I am either talking over you because I'm excited or I'm waiting for you to finish. But there's a, a really credible timing between us and people settle into, a, okay, this is how these two guys talk. I'm comfortable and I will continue to follow the exchange rather than seeing the exchange as being full of static and noise and things that make me feel it's it's not professionally credible and then physio vocal training sounds a little bit more cut and dry it's training your voice and training your body you know voice and movement so how do you speak audibly and credibly and how can you sustain your voice for the two hours you have to perform physically how do you act in ways that kind of control or influence people's perceptions so you are interesting to look at when you're supposed to be and you can direct their attention elsewhere when you are supposed to vanish, as it were. And those char characteristics like physiovocal and uh, psychophysical, I'd like to relate them back to, you know, we've got space and time. And so psychophysical training is really about timing. And physiovocal training is about our use of space. And this, I think, applies to martial arts as well. Timing is a very important issue, but we always experience time in terms of space because we have bodies. So you think of all of our, you know, metaphors for time or how we figured out how to measure time, it involves a spatial displacement. So, you know, you have an hourglass, the sand goes from the top to the bottom. That's a that's movement. You have a sundial, the sun moves around the dial or the earth moves around the sun. Um, at the time of the sundial, probably they thought it was the sun moving around the dial. But uh, again, we have a spatial change, a movement change that indicates the passage of time. So uh, when we're going to do live art, like theater or martial art, we're going to be really preoccupied with space because that's how we get all our information is the changes in space that we experience as movement. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I always think of um, timing as being more important in, in terms of martial arts, but I, I think by the word timing, not time, I, I mean time through space. 
Yeah. So, yeah, so that makes sense, what you're saying. Yeah. And so I suppose to, you know, say, why is it interesting to teach people who are going to do live performance uh, martial arts is because they have this fairly extraordinary uh, physio-vocal training in martial arts. Something really particular to the Chinese martial arts because they've got this very close history with performing arts in China. Um, you know, if you're going to, I don't know, you learn singing for musical theater and you learn dancing for musical theater, most of the dancing you're going to learn is derived from ballet, which has this very held upper thoracic tension. And singing requires a different physical position. Most of our singing comes from uh, bel canto, from opera. And those two things, like people who do music, musical theater to me are amazing because they're doing sort of two slightly physiologically contradictory things at the same time. When you're doing Chinese martial arts uh, and uh, Chinese theater, I don't know if people have seen Chinese theater, you know, it's people that are singing while doing backflips and they don't, they're just the most extraordinarily skilled performers and they can do many, many things at once. And part of the reason they can do that is it's a single body template. The whole thing is a system and it is not a, con maybe it was a long time ago, a combination of unrelated things, but now they've all been unified. So you breathe in the same way uh, to move and you breathe in the same way to make sound. And so the idea of teaching people the Chinese, even Asian writ large martial arts uh, as a part of their performing arts training makes an awful lot of sense because they're becoming coordinated and learning about space in an incredibly refined fashion. So that was sort of my way into this and my, my interest. I yeah a very conceptual kind of long-haired person when I started out wanting to be an artist and I you know, sat around and drank coffee and read Michel Foucault and stuff and my teacher noticed that I was a sort of sleepy kind of cat and so he suggested that I go off and do martial arts and I remember at the time saying oh should I do dance and he's like oh you really need to wake up you should do a martial art so I got very lucky I walked down the street and you know, I was like incredibly lazy right like the closest kung fu school to my apartment <laughs> in Montreal and I, I really lucked out it was a very uh, reputable place and the Xu Meng Wang who was the instructor in that school and who later opened his own school and became my you know, really close friend and, and mentor. Um, yeah, he's a really, really good teacher. So I was very, very, very fortunate uh, in my laziness and, uh, and ignorance at the time. I think I had a roommate who was a Taekwondo black belt who had the aggravating habit of falling into full splits while making the coffee in the morning. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, you know, it's it's really sweet. He's like, oh, you should go do Chinese martial arts because like they're the most dramatic ones. He was thinking of Jackie Chan, right? So you know, I opened yeah, the yeah, yeah. opened the phone book. We had phone books at the time and uh, found this school. But as I did it, I started to and became more, you know, literate about different kinds of training and what the uh, outcomes and components and uh, views behind them were. Uh, there's a gigantic overlap and uh, particularly for martial arts that feature of movement training where you can quote, make yourself interesting or you know make, erase yourself and indicate you know the, the the zen thing about finger pointing at the moon you can choose yeah. like, look at my finger look at the moon and so a good performer is able to move through that effortlessly and uh, that learning is ideally a really giant part of from day one you know you're dividing your center of you know your the bottom of your body drops down the, the upper half of your body floats up and you, you're creating an opposition that's already dynamic and we learned this just in the initial postural training in martial arts and for performers mapping yourself and like this arm is really my arm you know, most of us are we're so full of habits and ticks and uh, you can see mine on the yeah. screen it's a it's an extraordinarily important and uh, it's an important subject and then using martial arts to achieve it is very effective because it covers so many things at once you know, form breathing structure movement 
at that point, I wanted to talk about um, the aspect of theatrical training being good for um, selling something to a, to an opponent. That you know, using using tricky techniques and mis misdirection and all that kind of stuff. But I think you're going to come on to that later on, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think we could actually do that right now because that is a uh, something that I think is really important. Uh, I got this from initially from a. This concept comes from a book, uh, which Plum Publications in California had translated from the Chinese, and it's called "The Spring and Autumn of Chinese Martial Arts." And I would say parts of it are marvelous. It's a little bit like a dynasty list followed by a battle list with you know occasional mentions of what we would call martial arts. Um, so it may be people looking for a lot of substance might be disappointed because those lists are now all over the internet. Um, but what is really great in there is this idea of chiao, which is translated as ingenious. And that's kind of a very high status translation of uh, that word. And the translation I would propose as an alternate one is cunning, chiao, which is being sneaky and tricking people. And this relates back to uh, something that Douglas Ferrer has written about, the idea of war magic. And we tend to think of all these things as, oh, that's primitive and old, and we wouldn't do that anymore. And we also tend to think of martial arts in terms of the amazing success and, you know, to be celebrated uh, achievements of combat sport, where you get rid of big, obvious trickery, you have weight categories, you make it symmetrical. So the assumptions of things like war magic and trickery uh, would be to make it as asymmetrical as possible. So I want to deceive you into thinking I'm already really great at fighting. So you wouldn't even think of fighting me in the first place. Um, the example that I gave in some writing would be like, you know, the difference between Achilles and Odysseus in the Iliad Achilles just wants to brawl with people and, you know, like, let's hope we can get it symmetrical and I'm going to just take names. Odysseus, you know, can outwit everyone and is, you know, he's incredibly lazy. He wants to stay home with his wife and kids. And he's, you know, the first thing we learn when we meet Odysseus in that story is he's trying to avoid getting conscripted into Agamemnon's stupid war. So that attitude of trickery pervades and it's something that we find a little in our like oh, no, no, let's measure this and have two evenly matched competitors and see who's better like we don't think in terms of trickery and yet we all fall for it um you know imagine when you go into as a, as a prospective student you you may not know that much but you know enough that you want to go and try something out going to a martial arts school and you watch the class and after the class perhaps the the instructor you know says well you know throw a punch at me and I'll show you how I would respond to that I mean you've already walked into their room like that's their space there's no way they're not going to do something brilliant you know unless you're you know a, a bit of a, of a I don't know a devious person and you're already extremely skilled and you go in and, and you know take out somebody who is not extremely skilled but walking into that situation you've already given that person you've ex you know the, the trick was i have a studio and a big plaque and i'm the i'm a martial arts teacher and you're like oh yeah sure i'll i'll punch you and i won't pull it back and i won't throw a second one and i'll watch you dance inside and outside and you know do a brilliant defense to an incompetent attack i mean this is something we see now we see it because of streaming videos all the time and uh yeah yeah rex quando <laughs> yeah and like you know, you, you know there's a lot of oh god this is terrible but actually there's a precedent for this in that it came from a situation where when violence occurred, it was extremely significant. You know, bone setting was simple. There were no antibiotics. It was really, the consequence was enormous. So chow was a way of preventing violence through trickery because violence, much as it happened frequently and with horrible consequences, was like the last thing you wanted to have happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
And so I think that that attitude uh, in traditional martial arts, which is an extremely, it sounds very devious, it's also very conservative in the sense of it's about preserving the sort of homeostasis of <laughs> there is no fighting. And when the fighting does happen, it's extremely short and it's a, extremely uh, loaded in somebody's favor. And decisive, hopefully. <laughs> but the the apparatus around it uh, that facilitates all of that illusion is theatrical. There are characters in the sense of role identity, and there is a kind of narrative. You know, you go through, there's a beginning to the encounter, there's a middle, there's a trick, and then there's the end. Um, and this is, you know, it's what I talk about the theater in the Chinese martial arts. It's not, you know, a musical comedy or death of a salesman. It's this structure. And then we also see this in terms of the demonstration of, uh, you know, martial valor within the community. We go into a room or we enter a space, we are the audience. There's a platform or an area that's clear where there are the performers. Everybody has role identity established. And, you know, like I'm sure you've been this person as well. There's the great master who yes. will do his iron shirt demonstration and you are, you know, you're Vanna White, you're the assistant and you're setting up the concrete slab on the, the head of the person and there's this extraordinary circus stunt takes place and that's a narrative. We identify these characters, we're wearing red sashes, hey look at us. Um, and at the end, you know, it can go into a kind of informality that extends the trick while also welcoming people in so at the end of the demo where we've you know done the iron shirt and you've smashed the bricks and uh sledgehammers on my head you say oh you know hey yeah stranger come up from the audience please you know kick me in the groin and i'm gonna take it by tucking my bomb way out <coughs> and and you know that that bridging of the gap between the role identities on stage and the role identity of the audience is a, is a recruitment skill. Either it's a recruitment skill like, I approve of this display of martial prowess in my community, or it's like, wow, dude, I'm going to sign up and take lessons from this guy. You can kick him in the nuts and nothing happens. Um, so these things, that is what I'm referring to as the, as the, the theatrical basis, the structure. And then, of course, there's the real presence of Chinese martial arts in Chinese theater. And um, we see it in numerous instances. There's the, the Mongol dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, where the yeah, uh, all kinds of Chinese martial arts wind up in Chinese theater. Uh, and apparently your colleague, Damon Smith, uh, I checked this, it's true. So the Mongols insisted on happy endings uh, to parts of these plays where, you know, typically the plays would have extremely kind of tragic, moralizing endings. <laughs> and like, no, Mongols are like, why would you do that? Like, no, no, they should live happily ever after. Come on, <laughs> the bad guys should die. Uh, and and um, the, uh, so it was sort of like Hollywood actually, but way back when. And then we have uh, the much more recently uh, in the, the what's called the there are many rebellions called the Red Turban uh, Rebellion, but there was one that's also known as the Opera Rebellion in the nineteenth century, yeah. where uh, essentially pe theater artists uh, I, I blockaded the port of uh, Fujo and uh, did all kinds of socially uh, <laughs> subversive stuff, and uh, they were of course eventually hunted out and killed because they were depriving larger central powers of revenue. And theater and opera, which I'm using interchangeably as terms to refer to China, was banned. And suddenly, this is around when the martial arts that you and I have practiced, uh, Chile Foot, starts to spread through the uh, opening of branch schools, which is really teaching the same curriculum. So this is the first time we would recognize a martial arts studio as something like from our own period where there's you know you go in you give your bag of rice or maybe you pay and you learn a standardized or roughly standardized curriculum and that roughly standardized curriculum included piles of set fighting that came from all of these uh, 
opera performers who had been rebels and who were in hiding. I'm doing a very rough draft of that yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we could be yeah, really yeah. pedantic about exactly what all this means, but that is a that is a not irresponsible sketch. And it happens in the Yuan Dynasty. It happens in the Qing Dynasty, and you know people just love to watch super duper fight choreographies. And uh, I'll, I can see you nodding and smiling. So I'm going to give you a word in a second. The thing I want to underline here is the omnipresence of religious folk tales and lore presented as theater in China. So in the 19th century. The population of Jinan in Shandong, I think, was 200,000 people. There were 20,000 stages that were professional, amateur, or private for the presentation of theater. So that's a little bit like the saturation of early television from the like, 1950s and 60s. So an enormous part of the culture, and one that was really crushed, modified, removed, etc., with the arrival of modernization. So when we look at these martial arts that are artifacts of a time before or a time during the modernization, we do need to recall this like prevalence of a certain style of really theatrical, really codified, lots of mime, lots of singing, lots of, you know, I love you, but I can't marry you. You know, melodies, really corny melodrama and amazing stage fights. This was everywhere, and it was in people's frontal consciousness. Yeah, I, th I think you said it was like the YouTube of, of the time. You know, it was just so prevalent. Um, anybody could watch it because there were all these stages all over the, the countryside. And um, the other part is not only people watched it, people did it. So the prof professionals yeah. were vilified. Um, people who know the history of uh, British theatre, like, you know, Shakespeare's theater, the Globe, is on the other side of the Thames. It's in the south, and they, you know, you're allowed to perform like for an hour and a half. I think was it from three to four thirty or something, and they stretched it to two hours. It's really controlled because this is where all kinds of bad things happen. People have a good time. People get drunk. Um, people have sex with the wrong people, um, etc. And so, similarly, uh, China it was a more extreme situation. Theatrical performers were the lowest caste, they were synonymous, like they were prostitutes, and they couldn't stay inside cities. That's why, you know, the Pearl River Delta, they're living on boats and pulling up to cities to perform. And, but they were hired by very high status people to teach those high status people how to perform. And then those high status people would perform to really high levels of skill to one another. So amateur performance was, again, like, I don't know, think of upper middle class people in Europe in the 19th century. Everyone can play the violin or the piano and like to degrees that you and I would now think of as are pretty professional. You know, like my grandma, yeah, yeah, my grandma, yeah. you know, could teach at the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. And, uh, you know, she just did it at home. But the level was really, really high. So yeah. that is going on as well so the, the permeation of theater isn't just like youtube where well it is sort of like youtube in the sense that not only do you watch it but you could make your own and so it's participatory yeah. as well yeah so basically it's everywhere <laughs> i was going to say when, when you were talking about trickery that wasn't quite the trickery i was referring to my, my what i was referring to was so much more lower level than your your highbrow answer <laughs> yeah <laughs> well your answer was better because your answer was probably the better answer. But um, I just meant in a really low level way. Um, like w when I'm doing um, jujitsu, the way the way you submit people is you trick them. You you trick them that you're going to do one thing and then you do the other thing. Um, and th ever since we've been having these conversations, it's dawned on me that that is a theatre skill that that you you pick up doing jujitsu like when i say i've got the mount position i put my hand in the collar and i go like this as if i'm going to put my hands on the other collar to complete a choke as your hand comes up to defend me and stop me doing that i grab your arm and change it into an armbar and i i, I sell you the choke and i take the armbar it, it's it's very much a case of tricking you into one thing and doing the other now 
that's a much more lower level <laughs> example than the one you gave. But I think it's kind of the same thing. I think it's absolutely the same thing. I think we're, you know, you're describing something at the tactical level, and perhaps I'm describing something at the strategic level. And because our experience of going to martial arts studios and practicing or playing is very tactile, we don't necessarily abstract it back out to the strategic level at all. Yes, yes. And like I had a similar one. You know, there's a Sansai Gen, the it's a standardized partner set with the Chinese uh, narrow bladed straight sword. And, you know, it's Adam Shu in some lecture or article mentions, well, you know, this form is really about learning to strike, you know, change between striking high, mid and low. And that's a good strategy or a good tactic. And, you know, I, I think I learned that form. Um, I, uh, then did this in swordplay. I was like, oh, you know, I'll fake high and go low. You know, and suddenly it, it worked. <laughs> like, <"Whoa." laughs> you know, I think I did it in a very uh, ridiculously over committed fashion where I went really high and went really low because I just, you know, been reading Adam Shu. And I was, you know, very surprised that somebody actually went for it. And I, you know, I, think I went for their temple and I got their ankle. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, so like there's a, this very, your jujitsu thing is probably a lot more <laughs> legit than my example, but yeah, that's <laughs> the goal level. But what, you know, what produces or what's the, the strategic level and maybe the tactical level operates you know, we would have this in uh, symmetrical fighting like boxing. We would have this in uh, symmetrical fighting in mixed martial arts. So the larger culture doesn't have a trickery strategy, but the trickery strategy is really local. And mm. what I think is important to appreciate about uh, Chinese martial arts is this trickery st strategy that operates at multiple levels and is a part of the community culture that was an orthopraxic religious culture. Yeah. You could just add that uh, if we talk about mixed martial arts, there's the, the trickery of taking steroids, <laughs> which is, you know, you could, that, that, that's a trick you're playing on your opponent, isn't it? And then you're avoiding all the tests in the right, you know, doing it the right way that you avoid all the detection tests and then having that advantage. I mean, that's another aspect of trickery, I guess. Friends who know about those sorts of things, shall we say, uh, we're talking about the confidence that you get from, for example, taking human growth hormone and being able to do multiple really heavyweight workouts a day. And so there's the fact of your strength, but then there's also the attitude that comes with that. That, you know, I've done what I normally would do over three or even, you know, three days with two rest days. I've done that in one day. That must really, you know, when we look at mixed martial arts stars and their strange behavior, they must be thinking about the world in a really different way from the rest of us, just because of yes. that confidence and perhaps that, um, my friends euphemistically call it horse meat. They've been taking horse meat. Well, yeah, well, that, that was what... Um... Alexander Overeem uh, explained away his rapid muscle growth uh, was that he'd been eating horse meat. And so ever since then, I think everyone just calls it horse meat. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, so there is the... Uh... <laughs> have we done all the theatre now? Uh, no, we haven't talked about mime, have we? So, mime. This is something that, that people have a horror of mime. I think... Uh, it's because of Marcel Marceau, if I take my accent away, uh, the mid-century mime who became very famous. And it was all, you can see this on the screen, but for people in the podcast world, he did something that was all about face and hands. So it was extremely demonstrative in a feat, and he used really overblown facial expressions. And this, of course, especially the expression of wonder, which is open-mouthed, <gasps> and people find this perhaps amusing initially and then very, very uh, aggravating right away. I, I actually, like Marcel Marceau is, if you 
look at old films of him. He's amazing. But the uh, the kind of satire of that and the, the bad imitations of that uh, have led to this you know, connotation in Anglo-American language, mime, right? Like everybody says it with a kind of, unless there's some sort of specialist with a little bit of, of horror and disdain. So, um, yeah, this is a bit of a wormhole, but I'm going to do it quickly. Uh, Marcel Marceau's teacher was a guy named Etienne de Croux, and he created this system he called corporeal mime, which was kind of derived from ballet. He did ballet his whole life. And uh, it was all about the actions of the torso. And if you look at old pictures of de Croux, he's performing like with a sh sort of a bag over his head and these little, you know, Greco-Roman type of underwear. So you can see all the articulations of his torso. So it is really interesting in terms of it's not necessarily strictly similar to things we would be doing in martial art form performance or practice, but it's whole body. It's not face and hands. And so... I would suggest that Taolu are, you know, it's mimed fighting. And it's got an awful, there, there's ritual greetings, there's all kinds of theater that creeps in there, uh, the halberd, excuse me, glaive form uh, of trolley foot, which is this, you know, stick with a giant paddle shaped sort, uh, blade on the end of it. Like that, the one I learned literally has opera in it where you're playing Guang Gong and he strokes his beard and he, you know, sharpens his glaive um, after killing all the generals, which is from his uh, particular myth. So it's mime and it can be mime at different levels. <coughs> like, lit, yeah, I, it's provocative, right? But It's provocative because of exactly what you said, which is that we think of mime as Marcel Marceau, um, you know, with his, his hands and his face uh, pretending to climb an invisible wall. Yeah, and I guess, like, you know, my, <laughs> hey, everyone, mime does not have to be effete and ridiculous. Uh, so if you're, you know, doing palche and jolly foot, you're moving back and forth, you know, throwing these round punches, there's nobody there. <laughs> That's mime. Yeah, it's also mime because when we, when someone sees it, like it's been framed in such a way that I see the empty space in my imagination, the empty space around someone performing a taolu is uh, it's a there's something there I imagine it right that empty space is given some kind of value because you know hey look some guy's kicking and punching and you know throwing and whatever it is he's doing or she's doing mm -hmm. uh, or they're doing you know the negative space around it, it like our, our imagination responds to that mimetic behavior and like we really like it because when Talu are done well the person looks like they are dealing super competently with either literal violence or, you know, other invisible forces that beset us, you know, that don't have a simple, simple location. And, and so, like, we all want that. We all want to be able to deal with our problems effortlessly. And we see the mimetic actions of the Taolu and we're, like, really taken with it, you know, and, like, the, the appeal of... Taiji Chuan forms done in parks. Like, wow, those people are so calm. They're dealing with all that change in an even, effortless way. Whoa, they did a high kick. Oh, and they're back to their, you know, they surfed that wave really well. You know, this is extremely appealing. And so rather than the, you know, potential distaste in the face of Marcel Marceau's uh, exaggerated hate face and hands and that sort of... Uh, overly demonstrative, low-status behavior that he does, Taolu is a kind of mime that is really inspiring. And that is a big attraction. And, yeah. and, yeah. It, and it's mime. It is mimetic behavior. It is the imitation, uh, the stylized imitation of fighting. Yeah. I mean, you have to keep saying it is mime because um, you just know that there are, there are tons of people listening to this going, it's not mime! I'm a warrior! No, but no, you're, you're a warrior who's miming. <laughs> And, you know, this, again, is a cultural thing that we look at other cultures uh, dancing and mimetic behavior is considered extremely virile or, you know, a strong demonstration of martial prowess. And it's kind of 
a very, if you want, parochial and local attitude that uh, in our own culture that that's considered something that isn't a demonstration of martial prowess. I think Tim Cartmell in one of his wonderful interviews said, oh, you know, like there's this whole thing about like Chinese martial arts being uh, a bit uptight about having sex frequently, shall we say. And then he turned around and said, well, yeah, but in Brazilian culture, you know, like the Gracies are considered, like I don't know, the grand old man Gracie was considered very spiritually uh, significant because he had so many kids. Yeah, and he had a lot, like <laughs> like 40 odd or something. <laughs> like quoting Tim Cartmel, whom I admire a lot, is kind of out of nowhere, but, uh, and so I may be doing it wrong, but that contrast of how we look at culture and you know which what what things we you know we think we're going into something with an open mind but we take all these assumptions with us and uh, you know you can only gradually train yourself out of it and by noticing it but those really opposite things of you know never have sex before a fight and he's spiritually profound because he's got millions of kids like that's a big contrast and the mm. tactical activity is the same right yeah yeah I mean, different cultures right there, isn't it? Um, so that leads us on <laughs> to the next, which is, um, I think you've got performance and then serious leisure. Yeah. Yeah, these are, Graham has got a list of all my favorite things and we're, we're going through this. Um, so this is a serious leisure perspective is an American school of sociology that looks at the things that people do in their quote, free time that they take extremely seriously. And I first came across a serious leisure uh, or leisure perspective. Um, I was reading a book about traditional Japanese theater as practiced by a whole bunch of retired Japanese women who have invested tons of money and all their time into learning this art and performing it for one another. And they take it incredibly seriously. And you know, traditionally, it's only done by men. The, no one is coming to see their performances who is not a friend or part of their immediate community. Uh, but like, the, there was a profile of the teacher in this book, and the teacher had used the funds she'd raised teaching to buy a second apartment below her own and set it up with the appropriate traditional stage and an eating area and a kitchen. And so when we we're underlining the seriousness of the leisure activity with this anecdote that people take things extremely seriously. And uh, something I, I think this is illuminating in looking at the, the behavior of uh, people in Chinese history who were involved in the military. Because if you look at the, the martial arts that we practice today, like the, the, the big Northern Six, only Xing Yi Tren can you kind of hold a line in formation. If you imagine a whole mm. bunch of people marching towards you, throwing, you know, doing baji, they need space. And um, yeah. also, like, like, or things that you know, the, the styles you and I practice that have all these wave punches in them, the chole foot, you can't hold a line. You're going to smack the person next to you. And also, the practice of, I know I'm being humorous about it you know, the structures of forms, but like the, we see in the martial arts that we have today, they're extremely idiosyncratic and they adapt well to dueling. They might adapt well to skirmishing and like somebody gets you from behind and you you have the, the, the skill to raise your arms to free yourself from the grab, but the uh, overall, they're really idiosyncratic. So they are not directly military. And if we look at the um, the 19th and 20th century, I think it's the Hong Kong General Strike, which is in the early part of the 20th century, the Hong, yeah, Sing, yeah. Hong Sing Association, which is kind of a fraternal group who play children foot, uh, and they are working class people, they're on strike, you know, they're, they're, they want to stick it to the man. And they also have a rifle team. Like they teach 
military drill as part of the club's activities. So like they did not show up to the Hong Kong general strike with wave punches and uh, you know medieval oh, weapons. Double hook swords. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, they showed up with guns. Their identity was based around the practice of chole foot, which they did as serious leisure. And uh, but when things got serious. Yes, they weren't going to leave the guns at home, were they? You know, why would you? <laughs> and they, you know, they lined up, they closed the gaps that would have immediately appeared if you've got a whole bunch of people throwing sao choy at the same time. Right? <laughs> you you can't hold the line. Um, it, you you may do very very well in a ring. Like there's that I can't remember the guy he knocks out uh, Kung Le. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've only seen it written down. The Vietnamese Sanda fighter. Yeah, people just call him Kung Le, but that's probably wrong. You're right. There's so he just hops back using a perfect horse stance, throws a sao choy and knocks someone out in, you know, like the first quarter second of a fight. And, you know, everyone who does choy yeah. fights like, yes, finally. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, so the serious leisure, the, the military, especially officers and generals, people in charge, would have this as their serious leisure, the Chinese martial arts. They would refine their skill to an incredibly high level by essentially performing these you know really really difficult stunts of coordination and um, I was thinking about this because I had the good fortune to meet uh, Ma Yu and he is the son of Ma Xianda who founded kind of set up the contemporary wushu system you know, sort of Chinese Wushu royalty. And in their family, they have uh, like six generations of people were generals. Yeah, and uh, when the state set up the Wushu system, uh, Ma Senior became, you know, an elite coach for high-end athletes. And rather than becoming the special forces trainer for commandos and like ma jr you know he's jet lee's senior classmate he's 12 years older than i you know fitter faster better like an, an unbelievably impressive person and uh, mm. you know he recounted with sort of wry good humor the um, the people who are going to shoot that Shaolin Temple early film show up at Beijing Sports University and they're like, yeah, we need wushu athletes for our film. And the coach was like, yeah, 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 Lee can go, Ma, you, you're too good, you have to stay. And so, of course, you know, <laughs> Jet Li gets extremely famous and uh, I think they're good friends. I've seen lots of pictures of them together and, you know, Ma has to stay and do extra stretch kicks, you know. <laughs> it's like you're not allowed to go <laughs> and play for recess. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, but this, uh, this serious leisure is, has, the, has portray, like, uh, what's the right word? It's transformed uh, into a whole series of modern activities we recognize, like recreational martial arts done in a rec center for health, recreational martial arts uh, that lead to combat sport uh, trajectories, and then you know the Chinese system, which is really the only thing like it in the world, where you have a state system to promote this elite athletic activity. And of course, people tend to crap all over wushu uh, because they're talking about wushu. It's a little bit like maso maso. The wushu taolu competitors don't fight. And of course, if you look at their athletics, the only reason they don't fight, you know, is because they choose not to. And they're training at other things. They're extraordinary athletes. Yeah. Um, and that's from my friend Chad Eisner. I didn't come up with that. He's like, the only reason wushu athletes can't fight is because they don't. And if you've ever had the misfortune to take a high performance level wushu class, which, you know, will instantly gas you, uh, you you're like, yeah, probably. So wushu also contains, you know, the Chinese uh, kickboxing rule set, the sanda, and Two things that really haven't taken off very well but are really interesting are a short weapon fencing system and a long weapon fencing system. So there was a very complete idea there. Of course, the manifestation of that idea is like kind of mixed, but the, um, I don't know, the people who can barely touch their toes grumbling about how wushu athletes aren't doing real martial arts. Like, oh, 
geez, really, you know, like, yeah, yeah. that that one is a little bit hard. To, it's harder to understand the the parochial bias compared to like Marcel Marceau. I get it. Yeah, I, I say I I can understand people watching Wushu and not enjoying it. Not ne- not necessarily saying, "Oh, this is just terrible," um, but I could I can understand them watching it and going, "Well, I'm just bored." Mm-hmm. You know, th- that's that's understandable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also be like watching a sport you haven't done compared to watching a sport you have done. Like when I was in high school, I used to yeah, run, yeah. I did swimming, uh, competitive swimming, which is really dull to watch. But I really I love watching. It. I find swimming so dull to watch. But like you say, I don't. I'm not a competitive swimmer, so of course I do. Yeah. You know, so that we've gotten a little off off to the side, but the um, the serious leisure allows us to look at how something as profoundly refined as Chinese martial arts could come to be, and it covers kind of its. This is you know participatory recreation and entertainment. Uh, like that's a big part of what these martial arts are and were. And we can see that more clearly imagining this as the serious leisure of people who didn't have all the contemporary distractions. Perhaps they were illiterate or, you know, most Chinese people could write their name, but they weren't super literate, couldn't get their hands on books. That wasn't part of their culture. what would they do with their time? There's no television, there's no movies, there, there's opera from time to time, so opera's a big part. But again, it, there's the overlap of, uh, of this, you know, learning to do things yourself and the accounts even of people who were in Beijing in the early part of the uh, 20th century. I can't remember his name, uh, Liu Xinghan, and I'm probably mangling that. One of the Bagua, Beijing Bagua teachers said, well, we would challenge each other to see how much we could remember. And so there was this, you know, people developed incredible memorization capacities uh, because they were practicing all day, every day. There's a whole thing of, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be sweating when you practice. But obviously everyone is sweating because they're practicing so hard. The understanding the vector of... Uh, Elite athletics and community athletics is really well explained, or you know, the, the serious leisure perspective casts a lot of light on that. And it seems to have the, the serious leisure perspective came to the fore in Chinese martial arts as the religious uh, side sort of receded or was stripped out. Is that fair? Maybe I think we can see it better because we, you know, we know what. A class at the YMCA is, and we know what like well, Olympic gymnastics are, but I think it was always present, just in a very culturally specific form. So when I think of the six generations of generals in uh, Ma's family, those people got up early and had their practices, and it's very you know the Ma's are very famous for having codified a, a set for that kind of giant cleaver, the dadao, which was used. They taught a, a militia set with that two-handed chopper. And of course, that is a very straightforward and easy to learn thing. But their own practice was really hard to learn and really involved. And, you know, it was uh, gong, you know, like this work over a really, really, really long time. So that isn't something that is very functional. You know, you're not going to get people to be able to fight in short periods of time in orderly ways that can, you know, repel larger forces. But your own practice, which you have with your for your whole life, and you know, you're handing on to your children, those things are quite quite significant. And I would put that into serious leisure because it's really a big part of the of the people who are doing its identities even before the modern period i think we've have, have we reached the the end of a very long list yeah i feel i feel we have you know that i i have a little summation some uh thing that i thought would be good beginning of this conversation i 
introduced the idea of orthopraxic religion, and I gave the Chris Kavanaugh's example of the you know the Shinto baby naming and the Christian wedding and the Buddhist funeral, and those things from an orthodoxic perspective that we tend to have, that sounds like a little bit of a pork daiquiri, you know, like a, that's a, those things are incompatible. And if we examine things with a culturally open mind, we can tolerate these combinations that are alien to us and see how they are you know, productive of greater understanding. And so I would reiterate these things that coexist happily in Chinese martial arts. Pragmatic combat skill, religious mm. inaction, not inaction, inaction, religious inaction, participatory recreation, competitive athleticism, and performed entertainment. So those things we tend to separate out into slightly incompatible categories. And I hope with the picture that I've painted of uh, orthopraxic worldview, that this is a little bit more uh, tenable and understandable. Well, that was brilliant. Um, I, I I think you nailed it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. And in fact, I'm going to once once I finally get this together as a podcast, I'm going to listen to the whole thing again from the start, um, um, and then maybe just read your your quote at the start a few more times as well. Because um, th there's so much there, um, and it's, it was really just really lovely to to meet someone who has so many <laughs> so many things in their head <laughs> that um, it, it's it's really rare to find somebody who can contain all that within one perspective. I guess it's obsessive compulsive behavior. Um, in the UK, you have the BBC, and in Canada, we have the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And there was a broadcaster who was an expert on classical music, and he actually taught, he's retired now at the same university as me, and his name was Peter Tiefenbach. And he was an extraordinary person, and I heard him answer a question once at the end of class. You know, student puts up their hand and says, do we have to know like everything in chapter three for this cha test on chapter four? And he looks at them for a long time, like with sincere bafflement and says, well, why would you want to know less? And this really <laughs> stuck with me now in terms of the acquisition of information. You don't have to make a judgment about it. You can just hang on to it until it makes sense or falls away. But, you know, we have this extraordinarily rich thing, which is the inherited Chinese martial arts. And there's so much to know and so much to practice. So it's, it's extremely rich. And like you can nourish that richness for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why would you, why would you only want, why would you want to limit yourself? Because mm -hmm. it's, 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 when, when asked as a simple question like that, it's very, it kind of, it's one of those Zen things, isn't it? It just strikes straight to the heart of the issue. Okay, shall we leave the, the world of Chinese martial arts alone for a while? And, <laughs> and go and do other things? But anyway, yeah, so thank you for enlightening me and, and our listeners. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always. And we will get you back on the podcast in the future. And even if we talk about the same thing, we'll just talk about it again, because it's great. Thank you very much. Lovely. Okay, thank you for having me, Graham. Thank you for joining us. You can find out more about the Tai Chi Notebook podcast at www.thetaichinotebook.com. You can support us by giving our podcast a positive review on iTunes and our page a like on Facebook. Just search for The Tai Chi Notebook to find us. Until next time, enjoy your training.